Internet discourse surrounding Pier Paolo Pasolini's Solo or the 120 Days of Sodom leaves me feeling numb and dissatisfied. Recognizing my capability to produce better work makes me feel partially responsible. This video is a burden ripped off my chest, an articulation of every point I want to make about Solo, in order to finally put to rest my self-imposed obligation. For better or for worse, this film has been a strange influence in my own personal life, even beyond my relationship to art and politics. This video is intended as a summary, analysis, and review of Solo from each angle that I find interesting and relevant. This is Jane with Style of Substance. Welcome to my newest and most definitive video on Solo. Marquis de Sade was a man of many trades, a nobleman, a philosopher, and an author of literary works on the sexuality of libertines. Those without moral principles and responsibilities who are free to engage in their darkest of desires. He is perhaps best known for his erotic works, such as Justine, Juliet, and Philosophy in the Bedroom, which merge political satire with pornography to stimulate the mind as well as the penis. For Saad, to fantasize without limits means pushing sexual taboos to their extreme. Rape and pedophilia are not excluded. In fact, they're at the forefront of his work. In literature, anything is permissible. L'amour, plus fort que la mort, disait Justine. Vertueuse Justine. Throughout his lifetime of controversy, Marquis de Sade was incarcerated at various points of time, and sometimes without even having a specific legal charge. However, he did act upon his perverted and blasphemous impulses, and found himself caught up in various scandals. He challenged religious norms through acts of defiance, having, for example, masturbated into a church chalice, and locked a woman in a room and scolded her for her Christian faith. He challenged sexual norms by carrying out his desires with women and men alike, by seeking out sodomy, engaging in orgies, and frequenting prostitutes. If it doesn't sound too bad so far, it's worth noting he also held children captive, and even imprisoned a woman, and subjected her to psychological, physical, and sexual abuse. And yet, the worst of his desires, or what can be assumed to be his desires, were left in writing and sometimes intended for his eyes only. The 120 Days of Sodom, or the School of Libertinage, is an unfinished sexually explicit manuscript written in secret by Marquis de Sade during his time in prison at the Bastille in 1785. The story takes place in a medieval castle, which houses four wealthy libertines who round up 36 victims, most of whom are 12 to 15 year olds, and subject them to physical, psychological, and sexual torture. The story is told through black comedy, which paradoxically condones and condemns the actions of the libertines. The work is an exercise in subversive irony. For Saad writes about the pleasure of power inflicted on others while existing in a position where he lacked all power. He didn't even have the power to finish his manuscript. After being transferred to another prison following the storming of Bastille, Saad believed his work was destroyed. Yet it was eventually rediscovered and what remained was published in 1904, 90 years after his death. 120 Days of Sodom eventually grew in popularity and went on to become a significant literary text, one that is studied even to this day and has influenced various philosophical and artistic thinkers. Marquis de Sade lives on in literature and film, including several films by Spanish provocateur Jesus Franco. 
Luis Buñuel in Salvador Dali's surrealist French film, Age of Gold, from 1930, makes explicit reference to Saad's literary magnum opus. As people are subjected to a 120-day orgy of depraved acts in a castle, as the survivors emerge, so too does a Christ-like figure, who returns to the castle with a woman, as the pain and pleasure have just begun. This film sparked controversy, as intended. Furthermore, in 1975, renowned Italian film director Pier Paolo Pasolini adapted 120 Days of Sodom to the screen, but through rather subversive means. Swapping medieval France for fascist Italy during the final days of Mussolini's role in the Republic of Salo, and applying a Marxist interpretation or imposition on Saad's work. This film, which went on to garner notoriety by the general public and critical acclaim by academics, was titled Salo or the 120 Days of Sodom, and was released three weeks after Pasolini's death. Pier Paolo Pasolini is a renowned figure in Italian art and politics, and is known for his films, poetry, novels, and prose. Additionally, he was a journalist and a playwright, and through his work he critiqued the political realities of Italy, including bourgeoisie sensibilities and consumer culture. He was a committed Marxist and was also openly gay, which informed the direction of his films and writing. Pasolini was born in 1922, the same year that Benito Mussolini seized power in Rome. His parents regularly quarreled with each other, for his father came from wealth but gambled it away, and became a militant supporter of Mussolini, while his mother came from an anti-fascist family. As he grew older, Pasolini critiqued fascism in his writing, and eventually cemented himself as one of the most revolutionary and important poets in modern Italy. Tra speranza e vecchia sfiducia, ti accosto, capitato per caso in questa magra serra, innanzi alla tua tomba, al tuo spirito restato qua giù, tra questi liberi. Ho qualcosa di diverso, forse, di più estasiato e anche di più umile. Ebra simbiosi d'adolescente, di sesso con morte. Historically, the most respected of Italian poetry tended to be exercises in nationalism, at the service of glorifying Rome, but Pasolini aimed to critique the country and its oppressive social structures. I poeti di cui ho parlato, Petrarca, Foscolo, Carducci, D'Annunzio, eccetera, sono dei poeti, diciamo pure, di destra. Cioè, hanno parlato dell'Italia da un punto di vista, diciamo, retorico, della forza della gloria di Roma eccetera. Pasolini invece l'originalità di Pasolini consiste nel fatto che è un poeta decadente e di sinistra. His journalistic endeavors also saw him following corruption in active efforts to expose it. The combination of Pasolini's political allegiance to communism and his private life as a gay man led to considerable controversy amidst widespread acclaim and admiration. Ad esempio, un grande poeta, sì, sì, certo, però omosessuale, corruttore, eccetera. Un, un, un grande saggista, sì, ma omosessuale, corruttore, eccetera, eccetera, eccetera. La storia di Pasolini comprende, della vita di Pasolini, comprende 33 processi, 33, che lo vedono accusato via via di oscenità, corruzione, vilipendio alla religione. Processi da cui sarà sempre assolto, sì. In quale modo? avveniva questa soluzione per Pierpaolo totale era innocente per i mass media no perché la magistratura in accordo con la stampa spiegavano comunque che egli rimaneva benché innocente corruttore omosessuale sovvertitore dell'ordine pubblico prestabilito eccetera 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 <totipo> Pasolini's 
Pasolini was well-educated and cultured, but preferred spending his time doing simple things with simple people in the more rural areas of Italy, among the youth who saw him as a mentor figure, friend, and for better or for worse, lover as well. Pasolini took a liking to young adults and teenage boys. At 41, he met 15-year-old Ninetto Davalli, who he considered to be the great love of his life, going on to cast him in several of his films. For context, 14 is recognized as the age of consent in parts of Italy even today, and at the time, sexual norms were being challenged in Europe. Now, I am neither interested in condoning nor condemning Pasolini's objectionable sexual proclivities in this video, but believe it is responsible to at least acknowledge this area of contention. Pasolini, however, saw his interest in the youth as love, not an attempt to exercise power over other people, something he critiqued in his writing. Ethics aside, Pasolini's love for the youth and for the human body is celebrated throughout his filmography and to great effect. Pasolini was known for adapting classic literary text, often rooted in myths such as Medea, Oedipus Rex, and the Gospel of Matthew. Furthermore, in the first half of the 1970s, Pasolini directed the Trilogy of Life, a series of films adapted from the Decameron, the Canterbury Tales, and the Arabian Nights, respectively. This trilogy was characterized by explicit sexual content, including full frontal nudity. Pasolini created these films to celebrate life, youth, and sex. To quote Pasolini, I cannot in fact deny the sincerity and the necessity that drove me to the representation of bodies and their culminating symbol, the sexual organs. This sincerity and necessity have several historical and ideological justifications. First of all, they are part of the fight for the democratization of the right to self-expression, and then for sexual liberalization, which were two fundamental moments of the progressive movement of the 50s and 60s. During the first phase of this cultural and anthropological crisis, which began towards the end of the 60s, in which the unreality of the subculture of the mass media, and hence of mass communication, was beginning to triumph, the innocent bodies, with the archaic, dark, vital violence of their sexual organs, seemed to be the last bulwark of reality. Pasolini intended the Trilogy of Life to combat the repression of sexual representation within mainstream culture, as he saw human sexuality as the true and final form of self-expression, in a world eaten away by the hegemonic consumerist monoculture. The films are extremely optimistic in nature because Pasolini celebrates these underrepresented bodies. However, Pasolini soon had a change of mind. The trilogy had been corrupted by the system it had been released in, reduced to a consumer product, and marketed as erotica, and then spawning porn parodies. Pasolini realized that he could no longer return to stories such as these without his work being subject to exploitation by the capitalist system he was critiquing. I repudiate the trilogy of life, even though I do not repent having made it. Everything has turned upside down. First, the progressive struggle for the democratization of self-expression and for sexual liberation has been brutally surpassed and thwarted by the decision of the consumerist establishment to concede a vast but false tolerance. Second, also the reality of the innocent bodies has been violated, manipulated, tampered with by the consumerist establishment. In fact, this violence on the bodies has become the most macroscopic element in the new human era. Third, Private sexual lives, such as mine, have undergone the trauma of both false tolerance and physical degradation, and that which in sexual fantasies was pain and joy has become suicidal disappointment, shapeless sloth. Even if I wanted to continue making films as those of the trilogy of life, I could not, because by now, I hate the bodies and the sexual organs. Naturally, I am speaking of these bodies, of these sexual organs, that is, of the bodies of the new Italian youths and boys, of the sexual organs of the new Italian youths and boys. In repudiation of the Trilogy of Life, Pasolini writes that the progressive struggle of self-expression and sexual liberation was defeated by the consumerist establishment's conceit to a false tolerance. The effect of this traumatizes private sex lives with physical degradation. Pasolini believed capitalism falsely advocated for sexual liberation through false promises that further exploited the human body that it pretended to uplift and celebrate. 
This led Pasolini to grow a disdain for human bodies and their sexual organs. Pasolini also believed that the influence of capitalism recontextualizes historical representations of the human body. And so the bodies that were once celebrated are now corrupted. This is ultimately what led Pasolini to direct his final film. The degenerating present was compensated both by the objective survival of the past and, therefore, by the possibility of evoking it. But today, the generation of the bodies and of the sexual organs has assumed a retroactive value. If those who were then thus and so have been able to become now thus and so, it means that they were potentially such already then. Therefore, also their way of being then is devalued by the present. The youths and boys of the Roman sub-proletariat, the ones I have projected in the old and resistant Naples, and later in the poor countries of the Third World, if now they are human garbage, it means that potentially they were such also then. They were, therefore, imbeciles compelled to be adorable, squalid criminals compelled to be likable rascals, vile good-for-nothings compelled to be saintly innocents, etc. The collapse of the present implies the collapse of the past. Life is a pile of insignificant and ironic ruins. Outside of Italy, in the developed countries, especially in France, the die has long been cast. Long ago, the masses have ceased to exist anthropologically. For the French bourgeoisie, the masses are made up of Moroccans, or Greeks, or Portuguese, or Tunisians. All these poor folks need to do is to adopt the behavior of the French bourgeoisie as soon as possible. This is what both the intellectuals on the right and the intellectuals on the left think, in exactly the same way. In short, it is time to confront the problem. Where will the repudiation of the trilogy lead me? It leads me to adaptation. I am adapting myself to the degradation and I am accepting the unacceptable. I am maneuvering to rearrange my life. I am forgetting how things were before. The beloved faces of yesterday are beginning to yellow. Before me, little by little, slowly, without further alternatives, looms the present. I readjust my commitment to a greater legibility. <laughs> Le sexe, est-il politique? Of course. There's nothing that isn't political. Salo, or the 120 Days of Sodom, is commonly seen as little more than a scathing critique of Italian fascism, when in truth Pasolini's primary target was pornography, and by extension, the perpetuation of consumerist values through television and education. Pasolini saw those social structures as comparable to fascism, as boys and girls remained abused and exploited, both on a physical and psychological level. However, their exploitation was simply concealed by the mask of false progress, the appearance of change, while the establishment remained unthreatened and even celebrated. I think that before, one must never, in any case, fear being manipulated by the power of the establishment and its culture. One must behave as if this dangerous eventuality did not exist. What counts are first of all the sincerity and the necessity of what one has to say. 
one must not betray them in any way, least of all by remaining silent on principle. But I also think that, afterwards, one must realize how much one has been manipulated, in any case, by the power structure. Pasolini's aesthetic values are antithetical to mainstream consumer culture. If Pasolini made a piece of entertainment, especially one with a reverence of youthful bodies, then he would become susceptible to the same capitalist exploitation that plagued his earlier work. In order to confront this dilemma, he had to make a non-consumable film, an anti-porno. Enter Solo. In collaboration with Sergio Chitti, Pasolini began production on one of the most controversial films in history, a work that drew distinct parallels between this country's history of fascism and contemporary concerns of capitalist exploitation of the human body, with the perverted stories of Marquis de Sade. The film was also intended to be the first in his planned trilogy of death, a response to his trilogy of life that would deal with violence and exploitation of the bodies of the Italian youth that was never realized due to the director's own untimely death. Solo, or the 120 Days of Sodom, is set during World War II in the Republic of Solo, Italy. In the film, the Libertines round up nine teenage girls and nine teenage boys to subject them to three months of violent debauchery. The significance of the number nine could be a reference to Dante Alighieri's 14th century epic, The Divine Comedy, a significant text in Italy. The film's poetic structure makes explicit reference to the circles of hell in Dante's Inferno in particular, although here it is anti-Inferno, the circle of manias, the circle of shit, and the circle of blood. E la mia, il mio principale apporto a questa sceneggiatura è consistito nel dare alla sceneggiatura una struttura di carattere dantesco che probabilmente era già nelle idee di Desad. Cioè ho diviso la sceneggiatura in gironi e ho dato loro insomma una specie, ho dato alla sceneggiatura una specie di verticalità e di, e di ordine di carattere dantesco. fuori dai confini di ogni legalità. Nessuno sulla terra sa che voi siete qui. Per tutto quanto riguarda il mondo, voi siete già morti. Four wealthy libertines, titled the Duke, the Bishop, the President, and the Magistrate, engage in debauchery by swapping each other's daughters in marriage. <laughs> The men line up young soldiers and teenage boys and recruit the most endowed to act as guards in the remote mansion. Soldiers and secret police arrest the 18 kids and bring them to the mansion, save for one boy who attempts to escape but is gunned down. In this mansion, the victims might as well have no futures, no families, and no religion essentially no identity of their own. E dalla vista di coloro che non godono ciò che godo io e soffrono i peggiori disagi, che derivi il fascino di poter dire se stessi, comunque io sono più felice di questa canaglia che si chiama popolo. The audience is given little context into who these girls and boys are. As the film distances us from these subjects, essentially turning individuals into props in scenery, the audience doesn't even know how these subjects feel at a given moment. Some cry, some laugh, some bear blank expression. In Solo, Pasolini aims to illustrate that the physical body of the Italian youth and its sexual organs have been commodified by external oppressive factors. 
The kids sometimes even appear to be relatively willing participants, eager to play the libertine sick and twisted games, either as a result of Stockholm Syndrome, ideological brainwashing, and or a cathartic sense of false sexual liberation. This is comparable to consumerism promising luxury and liberation, while in actuality eating away at the body and soul. Tutto è buono quando è eccessivo. Sit or lie comfortably. You may even want to invest in a meditation chair or cushion. Si tu sens que c'est grotesque, close your eyes. C'est grotesque. Make no effort to control the breath. Simply breathe naturally. Si tu sens que c'est bon, c'est bon. Ressens ce que tu veux ressentir, mais essaye de ressentir quelque chose. Focus your attention on the breath and on how the body moves with each inhalation and exhalation. Notice the movement of your body as you breathe. Observe your chest, shoulders, ribcage, and belly. Simply focus your attention on your breath. Without controlling its pace or intensity, if your mind wanders, return to your focus. Back to your breath. In Circle of Manias, four middle-aged prostitutes collaborate with the libertines by telling depraved stories to stimulate and satisfy them. The beauty of art and storytelling is their potential to appeal to the pathos and inspire people to express themselves and fulfill their passions. But here, stories are told to evoke only negative emotions and inspire evil passions. Signore mio, lo so bene, sono stata avvertita di non omettere alcun dettaglio e di entrare nei minimi particolari tutte le volte che si possano servire a gettar luce sulla personalità umana, ovvero su un determinato genere di passione. Sometimes these stories lead the libertines to take action and rape or torture the kids, including humiliating the daughters by making them serve food in the nude. <laughs> One is even sodomized by a guard, sparking the libertines to laugh and eventually sing on the Parati Bridge while eating corrupting the melodic beauty of the song with their ugliness and perversion. <laughs> On the Parati Bridge was originally sung by the Giulia Alpine Brigade during the Italian campaign in Greece during 1941. The bridge signifies a point of no return, in particular at the start of the campaign in the time of fascist Italy. The line which perhaps stands out most translates to the best youth go to the ground, an explicit reference to the sacrifice of Alpine soldiers in Italy. Though here it also takes on a new meaning. The bodies of the Italian youth exploited and mutilated for the sadistic satisfaction of imposing forces. The moment marks a point of no return for the youth, for their fates are sealed by the Libertine's rigorous code. The Libertines sing the song, and the moment is somber, but the nationalistic overtones frame the sacrifice of Italian bodies to serve a greater cause, in this case surrendering their bodies to the will of the Libertines. Of course, this is no noble cause, but neither is serving a fascist army. It is of no surprise that the National Alpine Association did not take kindly to Pasolini's use of the song. Sul ponte di Berati, bandiera nera, la meglio gioventù la va sotto terra, la meglio gioventù la va 
sotto terra. For all its ugliness and dehumanization, the film is still marked by beauty and humanism, which will be expanded upon later in this video. The use of music here may seem beautiful, but the ironic expression and contextualization in a scene of rape renders the insisted aesthetic of beauty and grandeur present, but empty as consumer goods. In his manuscript, Marquis de Sade exhibits a sense of satirical self-awareness and how he plays up the superficial image of importance underlying liberty and sexuality, which he ironically enough can't help but relish within the abyss of his dark literary mind. Non c'è nulla di più contagioso del male. Lei eccellenza mio avviso in errore. C'è gente che non riesce a comportarsi male se non quando la passione le spinge al male. Solo scenery also reflects libertine fantasy as Pasolini's recurring use of symmetry and wide shots against the backdrop of the mansion walls and corridors with subjects framed in the center evokes associations with traditional works of art, capturing the vast beauty of the world and the people within it. But here the art depicts the body exploited and suffering. And the sickening perceived beauty and importance present is an imposed aesthetic of true ugliness, the rape of beauty. <laughs> the victims are ostensibly rendered props and playthings, hardly different from the mannequin that they practice manual stimulation on. And in their efforts to resist, their bodies are destroyed. E così anche le ragazze invece di nove sono otto. E a proposito dell'otto, mi viene in mente una storiella. The libertines once again mock the union of marriage by subjecting two victims, Sergio and Renata, to a forced marriage ceremony, interrupted by mass molestation, and their efforts of consummation climaxing with being raped by the libertines, in a convoluted effort to strip them of all autonomy and social customs, and reduce them to their own personal commodities. Pasolini demonstrates the effects of consumerism through the scene featuring the victims acting like dogs and begging for food to their masters, as the consumer's body is rendered a consumption of its own, and the products of consumption ultimately bring more violence than anything else. The ordinary, but ugliness is something extraordinary. Il n'y a aucun doute that of every ardent don't prefer dans lubricité l'extraordinaire au lieu commun. In perhaps its most overemphasized and overrated moments. Solo depicts coprophrasia, the consumption of feces. The novel deals with scatology and coprophrasia as a natural extension of human perversion and freedom from social norms, but Pasolini takes more interest in its metaphorical potential. The metaphor at play should be obvious by now if it weren't a bit on the nose already. Carlo, metti le dita così. Sei capace di dire non posso mangiare il riso tenendo le dita così? Non posso mangiare il riso. E allora mangia la merda. To reiterate common knowledge, feces are the semi-solid remains of food left undigested with the small intestine, broken down by bacteria in the large intestine, and discharged through the anus. In essence, this is the bodily breakdown and discardment of consumed products, thereby rendering coprophrasia as a feedback loop a continuous redistribution of the very same goods, which will either sicken the consumer with the same waste they've already digested, or condition them to not only tolerate, but rely on these same goods. Goods are in quotation marks, mind you. The issue lies within passive consumers' acceptability to essentially eat their waste without question, being ideologically enslaved by this circle of shit. It's as disgusting as it sounds. 
The libertines not only take pleasure in forcing their victims to eat shit, but they gleefully treat it as if it were a delicacy, all the while urine quenches their thirst in more ways than one. Questo suo amico sapeva però che la raffinatezza del libertinaggio è quella di essere al tempo stesso carnefice e vittima. Mia sorella, mia sorella. The Duke remarks that the true libertine fantasy is serving both the roles of executioner and victim, and yet the sadomasochistic interplay cannot truly be achieved with such power dynamics, for the victim in the situation is not a willing participant in sadism, but a controlled and coerced participant in masochism. This serves as commentary of disparities within power structures that eventually consumes a nation, making way for what Pasolini called an anarchy of power, in which power is systematically and sadistically abused by the wealthy against the interest of the people. Anarchy is used liberally here. To quote Pasolini, All of Marquis de Sade's sex, that is, Sade's sadomasochism, has a very specific, very clear function. That is, to represent what power does to the human body, the reduction of the human body to a thing, the commodification of the body. That is, practically the annihilation of the personality of others, of the other. Solo is therefore a film not only about power, but about what I call the anarchy of power, because nothing is more anarchic than power. Power practically does what it wants, and what power wants is completely arbitrary, or dictated to it by its economic needs that escape the common logic. I take it as a metaphor of the relationship of power with those who are subordinate, and therefore it's applicable to everyone. Evidently the impetus came from the fact that I especially hate the power of today. The power that manipulates bodies in a horrific way, which has nothing to envy the manipulation done by Himmler or Hitler. He manipulates them by transforming their consciousness. In the worst way, by insinuating new values which are alienating and false values, the values of consumption, which carry out what Marx calls a genocide of real and living established cultures. Noi fascisti siamo i soli veri anarchici. Naturalmente una volta che ci siamo impadroniti dello Stato, infatti la sola vera anarchia è quella del potere. The urge, the need to swing a crowbar to attack, to kill, it's powerful. And it's in all of us, but it will no longer remain just the private, risky experience of those who, how shall I say it, uh, have touched the violent life. Stop kidding yourselves. You and your schools, your television, your complacent newspapers, you are the great preservers of this appalling tradition that is based on the idea of possessing and destroying. Furthermore, the audio mixing throughout the film, and especially in this circle, incorporates what sounds to be military aircrafts and explosion rumbles, indicating a battle in the periphery of the Libertines. They may be so caught up in carrying out their own perversions that they lose sight of the fact that their days are numbered. Or perhaps knowing this actually feeds into their masochism, the same masochism that the Duke acknowledges. Alternatively, we can take these sound choices to be non-diegetic, and merely serve to reinforce the theme of an internal war growing between power and those subjected to power. Out of the female victims, Renata is given the most attention and depth. She even reveals information about her religious and familial background. One storyteller explains she murdered her own mother, which triggers Renata to cry out in grief over the murder of her own mother. Piange perché per prenderla abbiamo dovuto aspettare che uscisse con la mamma, e quella stupida di sua mamma per difenderla è precipitata nel fiume dove è annegata. Questi vostri discorsi le hanno fatto venire in mente sua madre, ricordate? Essa morì nel tentativo di proteggerla. Ma è splendido! This perverted form of storytelling fulfills the artistic goal of eliciting emotions and self-reflection. However, these emotions are exploited by the libertines and treated like pornography. 
Non so mai essere maledetti i miei occhi se questa lagna non è la cosa più eccitante che abbia mai udito. As Renata is forced to strip down, she begs God to put an end to her life and her suffering, which angers the Duke, for religion is forbidden in the Libertine's mansion. I più piccoli atti religiosi da parte di qualunque soggetto verranno puniti con la morte. La piccola ha invocato Dio, eccellenza. La scriva subito sul libro delle punizioni. Ne merita una terribile. Sì, subito. Ma la più terribile, in modo che possa raggiungere mia madre. Non aver fretta. It's worth noting that Pasolini was an atheist and a strong critic of what he referred to as clerico-fascist, the post-war Christian Democrats who manipulated power and condoned consumerist values. Catholicism is the superficial crust over the Italian people, and I believe that it'll only take a strong confrontation to destroy these ideals. I think that the gospel is one of the many books of religious propaganda that have been written. There will come a time when the gospel will be linguistically incomprehensible to humanity. The church will probably be able to continue for centuries to come if it creates an ecclesiastical assembly that continually negates and recreates itself. My criticism is against the church as a power as it is today. I said that when I was a boy I believed, I prayed, but it wasn't anything very serious. I think there are some facets in my character that have something of a mystifying quality. I'd say that this is part of the trauma that dominates my existence. Nature doesn't seem natural to me. It's a sort of act between me and the naturalness of nature. In 1964, Pasolini directed The Gospel According to Matthew, a Marxist interpretation and reconstruction of the life of Jesus Christ from biblical myth. The film was made in response to Marxist conformity and neglect of life's mysteries, including religion and spirituality, fundamental interest of humanity that communists tend to neglect. Come mai un marxista come lei trae tanto spesso ispirazione da soggetti che escono dal Vangelo o dalle testimonianze dei seguaci di Cristo? Ma se per torniamo sempre a quella cosa qui ad Umberto Vignardi, cioè quel mio vivere in maniera molto interiore le cose, cioè evidentemente il mio sguardo verso le cose del mondo, verso gli oggetti, è uno sguardo non, non, non naturale, non laico, vedo sempre le cose come un po' miracolose, ogni oggetto per me è miracoloso, cioè ho una visione in maniera sempre informe, diciamo così, non confessionale, ma in certo, in certo modo religiosa del mondo. Ecco perché investo questo, questo, questo mio modo di vedere le cose anche nelle mie opere. When Renata acknowledges her Christian faith in Salo, Pasolini ostensibly reinforces this perspective. The libertines strip Renata of her right to faith and family, not simply because it hurts her and imposes on their will to power, but also because these are defining traits of an individual's personhood and the outside society they originate from. I've never talked about the importance of the family. I'm against the family. The family is an archaic remnant. It's rather difficult to talk about my relationship with my father and mother because I know something about psychoanalysis. What I can say is that I have a great love for my mother. È follia supporre che si debba qualcosa alla propria madre. Dovremmo esserle grati perché ha goduto mentre qualcuno la possedeva una volta. Questo dovrebbe bastare a dire il vero. Naturally, the Libertines put an end to every attempt of resistance to their power, even when a desperate cry for help or a passive plea for death. Renata is forced out of her clothes and onto the ground to eat the Duke's excrement. Later, following another wedding, the victims are treated to a feast of feces. At this point, Solo may seem repetitive and feel redundant, but this structure itself is an exercise in excess, which elicits disgust and an agonizing, numbing effect for the audience as a deliberate condemnation of consumer entertainment. Eva. Allora spogliati e fa presto. Urlò il ministro. Non ne posso più. Quando ti avrò messo le mani addosso, su, vicia puttana, non salverai la pelle. <coughs> Eva, non posso, Eva. Tutto è buono quando è eccessivo. 
This segment of the film concludes with the libertine searching for the most beautiful bottom in a dark room. Colui o colei il cui deretano sia giudicato il migliore venga ammazzato all'istante. D'accordo. Franco is picked from the crowd and is fated for execution. This scene in particular draws attention to the anus, emphasizing an imposed beauty onto a body part with the biological function of defecation. Of course, for many, especially gay men like Pasolini, the buttocks is sexually arousing, but their function here is a reduction of human bodies to objects for rape and domination. What was once beautiful is now disgusting. Il mio capolavoro. Shadows cast over the victims' faces, leaving only parts of their body rather than the whole in view of the onlookers gawking at the human commodities. Imbecille. Come potevi pensare che ti avremmo ucciso? Non lo sai che noi vorremmo ucciderti mille volte fino ai limiti dell'eternità, se l'eternità potesse avere dei limiti. The final chapter of the film deals with the violent power that is subjected to the human body. Every sexual and violent act is a metaphor for the relationship between power and the people. The circle of blood begins with gender nonconformity coded as a perversion of social norms, as the libertines perform a black mass wedding ceremony of sorts while wearing drag. Pasolini taking a moral stance against drag, gay marriage, and non-traditional sex acts is quite unlikely, and these have become normalized in various parts of the world today but here they are framed as perversions because of the context of a libertine pedophile ring. As the libertines wear drag not to express their fluid gender or sexuality, but only because it is a taboo and a betrayal of social norms to do so. In theory, once effectively and organically normalized in the society, acts such as drag and sodomy would lose their association with debauchery and nullify their taboo status. Pasolini hints at the capability to resist power imposed on individual bodies. What follows is a series of acts of sexual liberation in the face of the oppressive power, which by extension reveals a level of humanism and beauty underlying Pasolini's work. The youth revolt by breaking code and engaging in consensual sex. The scene is marked with a hint of black humor as the libertines are perplexed by the resistance to their power and by extension reestablishing their humanity. Per carità, mio signore, se mi ammazzate, non potrò dirvi quello che so. Parla, lurida puttana! 
Tutte le sere Ezio va a trovare la serva negra nella sua stanza. Ah. Se volete posso portarvi là. The captives begin betraying each other until the libertines are led to the guard Ezio, who was caught sleeping with the black slave girl, portrayed by Ines Pellegrini, in secret. Qualunque uomo trova via, via i servi, cacciateli via! Pellegrini also played a slave girl in Pasolini's previous film, Arabian Nights, where her character, Zumarud, is given a surprising amount of sexual agency and a romantic arc climaxing in a happy ending. I can see Solo as subverting Arabian Nights, as he or she is given little character and agency, and her life is brought to a violent end. Lo sai, anch'io la so una poesia. notte Dio non ne ha create di uguali il suo inizio fu amaro ma come dolce la sua fine The libertines then point their guns at Ezio but he responds with a sign of defiance raising his fist in the air as a communist salute. The libertines are awestruck by this act of defiance and briefly lower their weapons as if momentarily touched, only to then gun down the quiet guard. In this subtle moment, Pasolini makes a case for innate humanity within all. For Ezio, it is signified with defiance, and for the libertines, it is signified by their awe and hesitation. The fact that even the worst of us are human is what makes them all the more monstrous. As the film reaches its conclusion, the fates of the victims are decided, with some sentenced to torture and execution, and others supposedly allowed to survive and maybe even return home. The victims showcase their last drops of humanity as they cry and pray together. Those with death sentences are destroyed through rape, torture, and murder, while the libertines laugh and dance. They also take turns looking out the window, through their binoculars, at the atrocities as they unfold. The audience is even given a binocular view of the site. They masturbate to bloodshed, symbolizing the way in which consumers are encouraged to engage with their commodities, either ignoring or being complicit in the exploitation underlying production as well as highlighting how the oppressor relies on the suffering of others for their own gain, in both fascist and capitalist systems alike. At this point, the victims are not only raped, but their bodies are literally torn apart for the amusement of the voyeuristic onlooker. The pianist stops her song as she realizes the gravity of the situation, where beauty cannot obfuscate ugliness, and so she defenestrates herself and falls to her death. As evil carries on outside the windows, two young soldiers set aside their guns, change the song on the radio, and begin to waltz. Sai ballare? No. Dai, proviamo. Dai, proviamo un po'. As they continue to dance, the film reaches its end. The scene remarks on art's role as a distraction from the reality of suffering. The soldiers are guilty of active complicity in the atrocities of the country, but they too are victims of the powerful forces which exploit their bodies and push them to their most sadistic urges that they otherwise wouldn't be privy to. Scusate, ma sono ordinato di fare così. In this final ambivalent moment, they give into their human desire for intimacy through the dance and recall their lives back home, meaning that the libertines did not succeed in stripping away humanity altogether as the two young men dance. Come si chiama tuo ragazzo? Margherita. 
bit tangential, but I've had discussions with Italian speakers on the gender of the mysterious Margherita. The English subtitles provided on most home releases specify that they are likely female, as the name implies. However, Italians have disputed the translated term girlfriend because what he supposedly says is el tuo ragazzo, which indicates boyfriend, rather than la tuo ragazza, which indicates girlfriend. Do pardon my pronunciation. Come si chiama tuo ragazzo? Margherita. Come si chiama tuo ragazzo? Margherita. This has also been counter-argued as a matter of differences in dialect between areas of the country, or perhaps ragazzo taking on a gender-neutral form. I don't speak Italian and won't verify the accuracy of these contrasting claims. Personally, I hear ragazzo. Come si chiama tuo ragazzo? Margherita. This Margherita, whoever they may be, is ambiguous, especially if their gender is intrinsic to the unfolding of the scene. The soldier answers with the feminine name, Margherita, almost as quickly as he asks the question of his boyfriend. Perhaps out of fear of homophobic judgment in the outside world. However, he is asked by someone without judgment, hinting at a brighter and liberating future ahead for acceptance of consensual homosexuality without the influence of oppressive powers. If he is indeed saying ragazza, the film still closes with a rare moment of beauty between two men, however corrupt, engaging with music and dance as the libertines live out their final moments of gory glory. Salo is as controversial as it is powerful. Some people, including Sergio Chiti, even hypothesize that the film is responsible for the director's death, though not because the film's subject matter incited violence, but because stolen and missing film were reported to be rediscovered in Ostia, where Pasolini was led to an ambush that resulted in his murder. Pasolini's death was a subject of speculation and sensationalism. In what is suspected to have been a gang assassination, Pasolini was run over several times by his car, had several bones broken and testicles crushed by what was likely a metal bar, and his body burned by gasoline. Then 17-year-old Pino Pelosi confessed to being the driver, and alongside three others, was responsible for murder targeting the man for his communist views. However, details of the case continue to be questioned even to this day. Io ho ancora solo una domanda da fare. Chi ha ucciso Pasolini? Chi non ha fermamente voluto si sapesse chi ha ucciso Pasolini? Per l'Italia si vuole eh, chiudere il caso Pasolini come un caso corrente e esemplare. In altri termini l'omosessualità porta a al crimine e esistono occasioni simili come quelle di usare il nome di Pasolini per ribadire questo concetto esistono molto raramente e gli italiani non se lo sono fatti sfuggire. Pasolini and his death became a subject for art. 
1986, the English experimental music group Coil memorialized the filmmaker in the song Ostia, The Death of Pasolini on their studio album, Horse Rotor Vader. This song was later used at the end of the 1988 Japanese gay exploitation film, Muscle, also known as Mad Ballroom Gala, which director Hisayasu Sato made as a tribute to Pasolini and his work. A golden sticky You can hear the bones humming You can hear the bones humming And the caravers is over Among the different films made about his life and death, Abel Ferrara's 2014 biography, Pasolini, stands out. The film narrativizes the final days in Pasolini's life and stars Willem Dafoe as the titular role, alongside Pasolini's real-life lover, Ninetto Davalli. Eppure, come tutte le comete, anche la cometa che ho seguito io è stata una stronzata. Ma se non fosse stata una stronzata, Terra non ti avrei mai conosciuto. Fellow Marxist filmmaker Jean-Luc Godard also played tribute to Pasolini through select clips in his films Histoire du Cinema and The Image Book from 1989 to 98 and 2018 respectively. Solo or the 120 Days of Sodom was posthumously released three weeks after Pasolini's murder. The film should be seen as Pasolini's swan song made at the inception point of a paradigm shift in political focus, and yet an unfortunate reminder of ultimately untapped potential for the director's future. As one may expect, Solo has had a long history with censorship, criticism, and of course, disapproval and disgust from the general public. Even to this day, Solo frequently tops lists of most disturbing and most controversial films, but more importantly, and more interestingly, the film has been acclaimed within film academia and by renowned filmmakers. One of my very favorite movies ever. Uh, I have it on DVD, but I don't have it on Ray, so I'm sure there are extras that I have never seen. <laughs> filmmakers like Gaspar Noé, Reiner Werner Fassbender, Catherine Brelaw, Michael Hanukkah, Abel Ferrara, and John Waters have all expressed their personal affinity for the film and its unflinching depiction of evil and human cruelty. In its typical contrarian fashion, Waters deems Solo a beautiful film, one that uses obscene images to represent power in intellectually stimulating ways. Salo's a beautiful movie. Though. I mean, Salo, that last shot of the two soldiers dancing in that beautiful yeah. set. I mean, um, P Pasolini, I mean, he's a Catholic saint to me. I mean, um, I want my gravestone to look like his. Um, I, I, you know, p I pray to Pasolini. If there's ever, I mean, so um, I, I think that movie's a beautiful, beautiful movie. And unfortunately, you know, he was murdered by a hustler almost right after he made that movie. So he, he died for our sins. I don't think Solo's obscene. I think it can use obscenity in a way to make a point about fascism. Um, I mean, about fantasies, about power. That, that, that's a movie about the pornography of power, really. So I think it uses the very extreme sexual subject matter in a, in a very intellectual way.
While indeed seen as a girl of obscenity and shock value, I found myself personally attached to the film, and like Waters, found an underlying beauty within the picture. That is not to say that violence and depravity are beautiful, but that Pasolini interjects a humanism present in his previous work between the lines and to beautiful effect, but this beauty is vanquished as swiftly as it appears. For as cold and detached as the film was, I still managed to find myself in tears and see a beauty beneath all that darkness. Perhaps Pasolini helped bring out my own queerness that was repressed for so long, a beauty buried within the darkness, and my reading of Sala was a projection and internal rationalization of my own sacrifice of identity. Whatever it was, I articulated this beauty I found in the form of a video, which resulted in unexpected success on the internet. In this episode, I will talk about a special film. A film that is as powerful as it is controversial. A film that has struck chords with me. A film that challenges me. A film that I believe is beautiful. Say hello, or the 120 Days of Sodom. The views rolled in, which led to stage fright. The comments rolled in, and suddenly, I only saw flaws in my work and in myself. I liked that the video sparks discussion, but the argumentation wasn't strong in the six minute runtime. A humanist reading is also somewhat antithetical to Pasolini's intentions, which is why I was compelled to write this very video. Though to be fair, even people like Foucault argue that Pasolini humanizes Saad. The scenes of the youth's sexual liberation in the face of the libertines, the socialist arm raise, Renata's cries for God, the pianist's suicide, and the final dance support my argument, but directing a focus here sidelines what these moments are contrasted with, and make them all the more significant. I like drawing attention to these scenes, but it's an insufficient representation of the whole. Though the video never intended to be that, but was ultimately treated as such, and so now I hope to construct a more precise and accurate representation. Pier Paolo Pasolini saw the representation of libertine sadomasochism and Marquis de Sade's 120 Days of Sodom as serving a specific function to represent what power does to the human body by manipulating it and commodifying it into a thing. Pasolini expanded upon his interpretation of Sade's sex politics by adapting it to contemporary consumer culture as expressed through the blunt metaphor of a fascist pedophile ring. The film is about the corruption of power and its genocidal effect on individuals and cultures. Solo intends to be a non-consumable response to products of pornographic consumption. And yet, audience reception shows Solo to be something of a failure and also success. Solo can be seen as a failure because, like the trilogy of life, it also has been co-opted in pornographic ways. Reduced to a consumable product to stimulate one's sadistic urges and interest in the taboo. The legacy should also be expected given Marquis de Sade's relationship to his own writing, his own written documentation of what is presumed to be his own perverted sexual fantasies. However, Solo also succeeds. It succeeds as predictive messaging for how widespread consumer culture evolves, to the point that Solo's legacy remains a pornographic product too. For this reason, serious analysis of Solo's themes must at least consider Pasolini's political intent to make sense of its strange and enduring cultural significance. This intent was not offered by my original video and was not offered on this channel at all until the video I wrote with Ben Nash, critiquing the Sardonicast consumerist coverage of the film. Many arguments from that response are reiterated here. If it is going to be a metaphorical movie about how oppressive governments are bad, then <laughs> I, need, I, need some, I need something more. Because yeah. there are countless movies about this kind of thing. Like we we mentioned the wall earlier. Like that's a, a, a way more entertaining example yeah. for me. De way more deconstructing thorough. these concepts. Exactly. Yeah, it deconstructs it more. It's more interesting, and most of all, it's more entertaining. Solo is not meant to be entertaining. 
The reception left my viewers polarized and for better or for worse, closed windows and opened doors. While I stand by the core arguments, I look less fondly on the cold and detached tone I articulate them with. Now, I'd like to see him and others do the same. Grow up. If Adam, Alex, and Ralph were to push themselves, they could bring more analytical discussion to the table. Regardless, capitalist consumer culture conditions people to either disregard or passively accept ideological conditioning, including rigorous, faux objective, formula standards, and criteria adopted while judging art. Yes, the YouTubers fail to effectively engage with the text because they are passively enslaved by the very ways of thinking that the film aims to critique. Solo, 120 Days of Sodom. Uh, we talked about it on Sardonicast. I can understand its importance for the time. Didn't connect with me on a personal level all that much. I didn't even find it all that disturbing either. There were like, there's like one scene that was like pretty disturbing. It was kind of like a meme movie in a way, you know? And I get it, like, there's people that get really mad when you don't take it as seriously as they do, but. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't have the same experience, I guess. In 1975, both Steven Spielberg's Jaws and Pasolini's Solo were released in theaters. While Solo established its integrity as an angry statement against consumerism, Jaws was a confirmation of what it critiqued, for it helps shape the modern blockbuster, the pinnacle of consumerist cinema. From then on, culture molded to desire the product over the desire of the artistic statement. And this is ultimately where someone like those on the Sardonicast are left. To see the continuous influence of Jaws, look towards Disney's recent direction with their Star Wars and Marvel franchises. When I go to a DVD shop, I mostly buy documentaries because you learn a lot from documentaries. There are not so many movies that really learn you anything. I, I mostly get bored by comedies, action movies, science fiction movies, they're, 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 they're so predictable. I tried Black Panther. I escaped from the scene after 20 minutes. I thought it was as bad as Star Wars. I hated Star Wars. Solo's values are completely antithetical to Spielberg's model for film, and yet people find themselves ultimately enslaved by the libertine Mickey Mouse, instead of resisting its power. Pasolini advocates for defiance and personal growth. This is what I meant when I pushed for reflection and growing up. With all this said, I've undergone my own personal growth marked by notable changes, especially in the last few years. My taste in art in particular evolves as I evolve as a person. And while I do not prophesy the repudiation of the extreme and visceral corners of political horror, I have noticed a growing level of sensitivity to such obscene subject matter. At one point of time, I would have considered Solo one of my favorite films, if not my favorite. Embracing sensitivity and rejecting aesthetic misanthropy, I find myself engaging with this dance of darkness and depravity on a new level. The film is a critique of pornography, fascism, capitalism, and of losing touch with humanity. The film leaves me sad, but also numb. Pasolini may have aimed to demonstrate a context in which all beauty is stripped away, with only ugliness remaining. Yet the man loved people too much. Yes, I still see a beauty between the lines, within all the characters, even the most heinous. That's what makes the fascist libertines all the more evil. They too are human. Even as they break away the beauty of the body, the socialist spirit remains. And the brief rays of an arm reflected in an in the awestruck eyes of the enemy, evil exists as a contrast to something else, something elusive, yet something real and true. The notion that the film could possess a secret or not so secret beauty feels sacrilegious, yet also in alignment with its irony, complimenting sincerity. I honestly do not think my words can do a work of art like this justice. For this reason, it pains me to have 
part of my young adult life incestuously tied to Solo, the Criterion cover left an immediate impression on me. A naked woman in white shoes sits down in tears, her body rendered an object overlaid by 120 tally marks. Brief research told me what I needed to know, and curiosity took control. I was being marketed a product. It was not even so much an interest in the extreme, but in, instead the intuitive understanding that regardless of whatever the critical consensus is, the film was likely an important one. One viewing of this film broke me down in tears. I watched the film alone, of course. I'm not sadistic enough to share this experience with someone else, though I probably am sadistic to some extent. Eventually, I found myself identifying with that girl in the poster. The days go on and on. My body is rendered an exploited object. And at least on the inside, I felt as though I was on the verge of an emotional breakdown, that so much of my life was shit being fed to me. I felt robbed of my own personhood, and my depression only worsened. In some ways, I found comfort in this film, as odd as that is to say. I was naive to neglect my careless complicity to a contrarian culture upon voicing my humble, hot take that would eventually haunt me. Solo or the 120 Days of Sodom is beautiful. Suddenly I was being judged for liking a critically acclaimed film. Suddenly my opinion was evil. I was called faggot and feminine and stupid and everything you can imagine. People, people swore at me. My sexuality and gender identity were brought into question and into scrutiny. I somehow managed to upset conservative moms and prudish liberals alike. It was clear that people were receptive to the video, and it was funny. It was fun. I was able to reach people. I was able to spark discussion, and sometimes good discussion. That's what I wanted to do moving forward. I decided to accept the criticism. I decided to move forward and aim to do better, to grow up. The politics of Pasolini's films also have taken a toll on me, opening me up to new ideas as to how to process information in a critical way. After all, he recontextualized Jesus in a way where I actually understood him. That's how art works, and there is some beauty in that. In a convoluted series of events, Solo is arguably one reason I am with the person I am with today, as she found me through it. It's just weird looking back at this with the benefit or curse of knowing that being awestruck by those tally marks on that girl would eventually catapult me into something else, to bring me so much anxiety but also friendship and love. I suppose I can detach myself if I were to try. It just takes some work. This film means so much to me, even if at this point I am sick of it. Goodbye to pure Paolo Pasolini and good riddance to Solo, that sick and twisted product of perversion. Solo or the 120 Days of Sodom is ugly. It seems to me that the first language of men is their actions. Even the moment of the greatest attachment of language from such human action, that is the purely expressive aspect of language, poetry, is in turn nothing more than a form of action. In reality, we make cinema by living, that is, by existing practically, that is, by acting. All of life in the entirety of its actions is a natural, living film.
Uh, I gotta look up the director's name. It's some Italian guy. 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 